your help, Mindy? <clears throat> Reminds me of, probably most of you wouldn't remember this, but back in 1998, we had on Easter Sunday, uh, do I got enough volume? Can you hear me? Or maybe just a little bit louder, Matt, if that doesn't bother you. Um, in 1998, we, were, we had Easter Sunday, and we had, uh, I remember the Greases had to sit on the front row because we had too many people. And so we got the deacons together, and we said, um, we, we should think about two services. I suggested that, and that was when we went to that Easter Sunday. And, um, but we needed a pianist for the eight in the church, it was Mandy that stepped up and said, I'll be the pianist for the 8.30 service. The piano was over there, and uh, that's how we had a piano in that early service, and uh, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to have any kind of music whatsoever, so I brought back old memories, Mandy. Appreciate you willing to do this. And uh, Okay, we were talking this morning, and we'll have a word of prayer in just a second here. Here are our conclusions um, when we dealt with these ladies, and remember, what we are talking about is the Proverbs 31 woman is an ideal example of, of a person, but really, uh, I don't know a person that fits that, you know, with up early, bed, bed in the middle of the night. I mean, you know, just really does it. I don't really think that's the point. The point is to honor women of character and different characteristics that many of them have. And so we concluded at the end of this morning that consequences for sin are real, that God really is dealing with uh, us in imperfect circumstances. Our kids aren't perfect. We're not perfect. We fail God many times over. And so who do we look at this morning, just to remind everybody, so, especially if someone's watching online, maybe wasn't here. Okay, Eve was the first one. What was her big issue that she's got to deal with for the rest of her life after the fall in the Garden of Eden? Regret and guilt. Realizing, I mean, can you imagine seeing her son murdered and realizing, you know, it all started in the Garden of Eden, you know, when, when, I, when I made that choice and Adam, my husband. And so you could blame him too. I mean, there's a lot of regret and guilt that that couple particularly had to deal with. Okay, who was our second example? Sarah. Okay, I'm sorry? Sarah. Yeah, with Sarah, but no, actually not her, Hagar, her servant, right. And Hagar's thrust into a situation that is, moral, although it was accepted in that time period as being like a surrogate mom. And, um, and, and then again, some of the problems are going to be on her because she gets proud about the fact that she's expecting and, and, and Sarah could not. Um, and so there'll be conflict and she'll create some of that. But what does, she, what does really comes out of that account? What do we learn about God from, from Hagar? And what does she need to hang on to? Yeah, Joe. He did. God did create a great nation out of her son, too. He cares about us wherever we're at. That's exactly right. He, he cares about us wherever we're at. He hears our prayers. Remember, Ishmael means God hears. And God heard the cry of that lad, and he heard Hagar, saw what's going on, heard her cries out in the wilderness, and God answered and helped her. Okay, now the third uh, mother that, again, is not an ideal situation. Tamar. Tamar. Okay. And Tamar is it's her own plot really she has her children on on the basis of immorality and incest really you would call it because she is actually with her uh, father-in-law and uh, just a real real tragic situation and um and yet she makes uh, she and it seems because judah really does this she seems to also make a clean break with that sin there's honesty and, and confession about it and then she has a particular son what was his name Ferez, which means breakthrough or, or to breach. So we learned this morning um, that consequences for sin are real. And they're real for you and they're real for Christ. Jesus did have to bear our sins on the cross. So it's not just like we can do whatever we want and God just steps in and makes everything magical. These um, ladies are going to deal with the issues that we're talking about for their lives. They're gonna, Eve is going to battle regret, I think, till the day she dies. So it's not like you can just snap your fingers and take away consequences for sin. We can't do that. Um, but we, and, and, and for instance, Tamar, she's not going to have a husband as far as we know. Um, uh, you know, Judah's not uh, going to marry her, and so she's going to raise those kids. Now, he's going to help. 
But there's, no, there's nothing going on between them as a couple. Um, there's no marriage. So uh, consequences for sin are real. We also saw, though, that God's grace can overcome our sin. And um, let's just go there to get us started. Romans chapter 5, quickly, because I, uh, I, uh, I just felt like I had to get people out this morning. Um, didn't want to keep them too long on, on, on Mother's Day when, when I know there are plans and that type of thing. Romans chapter 5, I, I'm, I'm starting at verse 15. Um, great passage of scripture. It says, but as the, if not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. And that not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification. Okay, now again, he's, he's talking in, 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 in terms that if we don't know what he's talking about, it'd be kind of hard to get where he's going. Who is the one person that brought sin into the world that God holds responsible more than anybody else? Adam, yes, not Eve, but Adam. Adam was the guy that, that had the commandment, knew he was wrong, took the fruit. Eve was deceived on that. Now, again, Eve opened the door, but Adam walked through it. All right, now, so he's talking about, okay, he's comparing Adam and his fall into sin with Jesus Christ. That's what he's comparing it to. So verse 17, for if by one man's offense, that's Adam, his offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So Christ did not sin like Adam did. He lived a sinless life, and then he died in our place on the cross. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, or the righteous act of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we're grateful for that. So we see that God's grace can overcome your sin. The third thing we talked about was turn your focus from your failures to God's promises. And it really seems that's what comes out of Eve's situation. Instead of looking back, continual regret. She's looking forward to the fact that a Savior's coming and I have a part in this. And even though it would be many generations before Jesus would come into the world, she's still looking that direction. You can tell that even by the naming of those kids. And then God hears the cry of the afflicted. Just as in Romans chapter 10, we're told that if thou will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So God hears the cry of the afflicted. All right, let's go ahead. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll get into the next mom. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the joy of being together. Help us as we consider your word. Give us understanding of it, Lord, and um, encouragement to all of us uh, to uh, when, when we're trapped and when we're, um, we've uh, fallen into uh, um, uh, disobedience and, and the snare that that brings. Oh, Lord, and those snares are real. And they don't just magically uh, melt away. But Father, we're grateful that you step into our lives wherever we're at and you help. When we call upon thee, when we repent and turn to thee, when we're humble before thee, you've said that you give grace to the humble. And I pray that we'll understand from these other examples some more principles that we can live by when our lives are far less than perfect. We pray for your grace and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now the next mom I'd like to bring up is Jochebed. And I would say that you could look at her as a mom of unfulfilled expectations. Now, why would I say that? Well, let's talk about, first of all, uh, what we know about her. All right, and there's a couple things that we can say without, um, that, we, that we're confident that are true about her. The first thing is that she saw God miraculously save her son. Now, in Exodus, you can go back to the book of Exodus if you'd like to. There's also another passage right nearby where we are in Romans, and that is Acts chapter 7. You might want to grab that one on your way through, because we will come back, and around in verse 22 is where we're going to focus in in Acts. But let's go back to the book of Exodus, and talk to me out of chapter 2, the first eight verses or, of, or so, what was going on when baby Moses was born. What was going on when baby Moses was born? Go ahead, John. That's exactly right. If you were a male a baby born 
in, in that era when Moses was born, you were to be, you were to be killed. And um, there's another passage we'll come to that deals with her too from, um, if, uh, from Hebrews chapter 11. But um, how did God, how did God save baby Moses' life? Do you remember? Right. First thing is, she takes her baby, right? And she makes a little ark. She tries to hide him as long as she can. Right? And then they make a little ark uh, because there's no way they can hide him much longer. His cries are getting loud enough and frequent enough that there's just no way to hide him. Can you imagine living in that kind of an environment? And so they make a little ark. This is the only thing they can think to do. And they, they uh, put him in that. And they set him afloat on the Nile River. Now, you know, there's lots of animals, probably crocodiles around. I mean, it's just not, it's not looking good. But they're doing everything they could possibly do to spare that baby's life. And as Mike said, who comes along and going out to the river to, uh, to bathe but Pharaoh's daughter kind of interesting if we have the dates right you have to follow the biblical dates not what common archaeology follows but if you follow the biblical dates it may have been a woman by the name of Hatupset this pharaoh's daughter she never married she actually becomes like a pharaoh in the land of Egypt she could have put him on the throne possibly it that's that's what Moses might have been dealing with okay anyway she finds him and has compassion on him and who was standing right there watching what was going on? Sister. Moses' sister, right. And it may have been Miriam. It may have been the sister that we read about later. Anyway, she, she uh, goes up to Pharaoh's daughter. Again, just, this is all God. You think of how God gave this, this little girl the, uh, the, the wisdom to do this. She goes up and says, do you want a nurse for the baby? And, of course, Pharaoh's daughter, she's not her child, and, and she says yes. She's, and, she'll, of course, who does she go back? She goes back and gets Moses' mom, her, her mother, and Moses' mom. And, and so Moses gets to be raised for the first few years by his mom. So Jochebed sees God's, God's answer to this. Now, I say this was in response to her faith. Um, if you keep your finger, I'm coming to Acts, but it's in Hebrews chapter 11. Here's what it says about Moses' parents. It's Hebrews chapter 11. You find it, uh, I think it's verse, uh, somewhere 21, 22. Uh, it's verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. And that word proper actually is beautiful. They said, he's just a beautiful baby. We can't. Just, just let him be killed. And notice they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, I do not know what the Egyptians were doing to the parents that hid their children, but can you imagine that would be a problem? So the Egyptians evidently had some kind of a major punishment that they did to parents that tried to hide their children from them. But Moses' parents said, we don't care. We're going to try to spare our baby's life. And God stepped in and saves this little one. We know something else about Jochebed, and that is she had but a few years to raise her son. Okay, now we are in Exodus chapter 2. Let's pick up in verse 8, and uh, notice that down to verse 11. It says, And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, that would be Moses' sister, Go, and, and the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, this is now she, Pharaoh's daughter talking to Moses' mom, Jochebed, said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. That's an interesting statement. You know what I mean? Not only can you say, well, wow, she got paid for, for, for taking care of her own son, but, you know, you almost wonder if that isn't a, a prophecy without intent. You know what I mean? The idea of if God says, I'm going to bless you, take care of this child for me. And the maid, uh, so uh, let's see. And, and the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Now imagine that one, okay? She, she gets to keep him about until she weans him, somewhere along in that neck of the woods. And so, not very, maybe two to three years old. Yeah, Mike? Did they change the child before the name of Moses? Is there anything in the Bible that says they changed the name of Moses? Uh, no, I, um, 
uh, I do not know that, that he, uh, what his Hebrew name would have been. Yeah, I do not. He probably would have been named because they typically named the children um, right around the time of circumcision, something like that, eight days, whatever. But um, his name is uh, to draw Mo Moshi, the idea of Moses uh, means to draw. And it came to pass, so, so at verse uh, 10, notice the Pharaoh's daughter basically adopts him. So Jochebed only has a few years to have an impact on Moses' life, okay? But I just want you to know, keep reading here. And she called his name, that's uh, Pharaoh's daughter, Moses, or that is drawn out, and, and, and because she said, I drew him out of the water, it's Pharaoh's daughter. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his what? How does he know that there is brethren? You know what I mean? I, I really am convinced that Jochebed taught him a lot before he left. Just a little square. I, I, keep, if you keep reading. When on his brethren looked upon their burdens, and spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren, and of course, you know, and again, it's called one of his brethren. Moses is beginning to identify not with the Egyptians, but with the Israelites. And he's a prince of Egypt. Why would he do that? Well, um, let's cheat a little bit. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 again. I don't know if you held on to that one. And I'm coming to Acts. I'm, I'll be back there in, in a minute. But Hebrews chapter 11. Let's, let's, let's read again. I'm starting at verse 4, 24. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years. Now, that's exactly what we're talking about there in Exodus chapter 2. When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So why is he identifying with the Israelites? What's he call them? What's God call them here? The people of God. Moses is saying they're right on who they're worshiping. Now, if we missed it there, look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of who? Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Moses, Moses believes that the Christ is coming through Israel. That's, exa that's exactly what he's believing. Where did he get that? I don't think he got that from the libraries of the Egyptians. I really don't. I think he got it from his mom. So that leads us to then what we uh, do not know about her. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about the fact, uh, did she live to see Moses rise in success and popularity? Because he did. This is before he was rejected by the Egyptians. Go to Acts chapter 7 now. Hopefully you hung on to it. And look at verse uh, 22. This is Stephen talking about Moses' life. And it says, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, that shouldn't surprise us because he's the, he's the adopted son of, like, the, the, the queen or the princess of, of Egypt. So that wouldn't surprise us that he, he's got a lot of wisdom and knowledge that he's gaining from growing up in the royal household of, of Egypt. And then it says, and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, did you know that? Mighty in words and deeds. He's talking about when he was come, notice again, um, that, that this is something he did. And, it's early, it's, it, and what is, is indicated here is this is before he's ever rejected because verse 23 talks about his rejection. We'll talk about that in just a second. So it, it seems that Moses, um, uh, there are some that was, that again, we're not sure on this, but he's, he may have been a, a great military leader. He may have been a, actually a, in his youth a great speaker. And you say, well, what about when he's 80 and he says, Lord, I can't speak, you know, I'm slow of speech. Well, that may have been something that resulted somewhere in that intervening period. So the idea is this, Moses, did she get to see her son really rising in popularity in Egypt? And if she did, what would she have thought about that? We don't know that. We don't know the answer to that question. We don't even know if she's alive at that time. We don't know either if she lived to see Moses' betrayal and rejection by his own people. Verse 23, we're in Acts chapter 7 still. And when he was full 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit, notice again, his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed, 
His brethren would have understood how God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. The next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, are ye, are, are ye brethren? Why do you wrong one another? Moses couldn't think of why one of God's people would harm one of, one of, another one of God's people. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Madian, of Madian where he begat two sons. Now, Okay, so does she live to see Moses rise in power? Does she live long enough to see Moses betrayed? We don't know that. We do know this. She is, is in all probability, that's where we're coming next. I'm pretty confident that we can say that she didn't see everything that God did through Moses. Because how old is Moses he's, when he's rejected? He's 40, okay, and she's a mom. Slaves don't live that long in that culture. I don't know how long she would live, but let's say she lived a decent life. Let's say she lived to be 80, okay? And so uh, if she was, let's say, well, let's even make a teenager. Let's make her uh, 18 years old when she gives birth to Moses, all right? Which would be very, actually, she wouldn't be that because she's got three older, uh, two older children, but let's just say, let's just say 18. Moses, at, at, by the time she, he's 40, she's 58. Okay, now... Um, I think we can safely assume that by the time that, she, that Moses comes back at age 80, she probably is not around. And she's not going to see all that God did with her son, or with Aaron, or with Miriam. And I'm just saying this, moms, sometimes you're not seeing where God's taken those kids. You don't realize that God's plan for them is not over yet. And sometimes we feel like, oh, my expectations were this and this and this. Jochebed would not have probably saw that. Now, here's what we can safely assume. I, I think I'm right on this, but I, I, I'm acknowledging that there, there, there might be other possibilities out there, but I, I really think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident on this. She had knowledge of two promises. First of all, God's promise of a homeland. Now, why do I say that? Back in, where you're, if, you're, um, if you've hung on to, um, you can leave Acts behind. If you're back in Exodus, I, I left it, so I've got to go back there. Um, let's actually go to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. And um, I want you to look with me as Joseph is going to be uh, dying here. Uh, look, skip down to verse 24. It's almost right at the end of the book. Genesis chapter 50 at verse 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. Now, I want you to think about this. He was saying, don't bury me. No, no, keep reading. Verse 26. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And it's rather interesting. There is an archaeological find that has just been um, discovered in the last, I don't know, five years or so, and uh, where at least some people are thinking they have found an, uh, a, a, a statue of, of, of a figure who very well may have been Joseph in Goshen, the land of Egypt, where the Israelites would have, been, would have stayed. And that would make a lot of sense because he was, he was an exalted leader in Egypt and among his own people. And he did ask that they, they keep his body in a coffin and bring it back to the promised land. That's what he's saying. Bring it back to the land of Canaan. Not now, but when, you, when God visits you and you leave. And I, I'm convinced Jochebed knew about that. Because not only did, was, was that promise being passed down among God's people, but there's a high likelihood that even that coffin was known as people are living in that area. And that was a testimony. God is going to send us back to the promised land. He's got a land for us. I think Josh, Jochebed communicated that to Moses. When God comes to him in the burning bush, he knows, he knows all about the fact that they're supposed to have a promised land. I want you to also think about the promise of the coming Savior. Moses 
believes the Christ is coming. And he is willing to bear the reproach. Now, again, could we theoretically have as a possibility that Moses might have learned that in the library of Egypt? Well, maybe. But I think I'm pretty confident that came from his mom and his dad those few years that he was home, telling him that the Christ is coming. And, of course, he would later be the one to actually be the penman for the Lord to record those promises in sacred scripture. Uh, we also can safely assume she probably did not live to see, though, what God did with her children. I don't think she did. Probably did not live to see what God did for her people. She probably didn't walk out of the land of Egypt as one of the people that was delivered. She'd have been, whew, if Moses was, was 80, again, she'd have been almost 100 years old, maybe more than 100 depending on when she gave birth to him. So, I mean, it's possible, but I think it's pretty likely she didn't live to see all that God did with her son. I, I like something that a pastor um, who I respect um, often says about people. He says, God has not written the last chapter of that person's life yet. I like that. I really do. God has not written the last, the last chapter on that person's life yet. They're still living. God can do great things. Now, um, she didn't get to see what God did for all people through the Christ that was prophesied. She didn't, now she could pass that down, but we know she didn't live for that. Jesus is not going to be born for about 1,400 years after Moses even gets the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, more than that. So, so she's not going to live to see that. She's going to have to walk by faith. So my question is, what would you say to Jacobin if you're counseling her? And she's saying, look, I have these great hopes. Look what God did for Moses. You know, he rescued him, saved his life. I, I was convinced God was going to use him in a great way. And maybe she dies when, when Moses was rising in popularity, and she's thinking, well, what good is that? You know, he's popular in the land of Egypt. He's done all these great things, and he makes great oratories, and maybe he's a great military leader. But what good is that? That's not accomplishing what I thought God was going to do with his life. Or how about this one? Maybe, maybe by the time she dies, Moses is in exile. Maybe she, he tried, you know what I'm saying? He tried to, 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 to deliver the, the Israelites, and they rejected him. And he's off on the backside of the desert. And she's again saying to herself, I had all these hopes that God was going to use him, and our people were so stubborn, we rejected him. What do you tell a Jacobed who's, who is, is thinking about all these hopes and dreams she had for her, her child or her children and they're not being fulfilled. What do you tell her? Well, I put one thing up. I, I'd tell her, keep walking with God. What would you tell her from the scripture? This is your chance to wax wise. Keith, you look like you're about ready to say something. What, it, what does that mean? In Spanish, go with God. Go with God. Mandy. That's pretty much what I said. Trust God with the results of your effect as a mom. Our job, we cannot reap the harvest. You know what I'm saying? We don't get to do that. It's not... We can't bring life. You can sow the seed. And you have to let God take care of the harvest. I, I can't guarantee, there's no guarantee. And by the way, she doesn't just see Moses have a great impact on the Israelites. She think of Aaron and Miriam. Miriam's one of the great leaders in the female side of the, of the nation. Aaron is going to be the high priest, and his descendants are going to be the high priest to right down through history. These, you know, these people had a huge impact. One mom. But she doesn't probably see it in her lifetime. Pastor? Yeah, Matt. Chronologically, doesn't uh, Job happen before this story? It's possible that Job happened before this story. It's possible that could be a story she could latch on to. On the fact of, of the Job and how uh, suffering and you not don't... Not knowing all the suffering. Not knowing everything God is up to. Very good. Very good. I'm not sure when Job was written, but you're right. That's, a, that's at least a possibility. Good.
All right, there's Jocko. Mike. You're, boy, that's a good point. That's a good point that she, she had to already trust him as a child. And, and you need to continually trust. We all need to trust our kids to God's hands. You know what I'm saying? Lord, they're yours. Not on ours. Keith. Do you suppose that Moses got the idea that he was going to lead them because his mother probably taught him that the Messiah, the Savior, was coming through the Israelites. And here he's being groomed as the most powerful leader of Egypt. And yet he chose to be with the Israelites, so he probably thought there's a very good possibility that I'm going to be able to lead them. Obviously, he wasn't going to be there. I think he definitely had the idea in his mind, Keith, like you're saying, God has spared his life for a reason, and God's got something big for me to do. And I think, I think he felt like, yes, I should be able to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And, and again, he has success in his early life. I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, let's talk about Naomi. Naomi is a mom who allowed tragedy to make her bitter, but she didn't stay that way. Okay, so we need to go to the book of Ruth. You want to go to the book of Ruth? Again, when we move on to a new lady, we're going to move on to different passages. And let's talk first about, about Naomi's suffering. I'm going to have to pick up the pace. I'm sorry. But some of these stories just really get into you when you think about them. And, and really, you could take a long time to do them. Uh, Naomi's suffering. Now, what, what happened to Naomi quickly? What happened to her? She, her and her husband make a decision. Now, again, we're not sure. I have questions on that, don't you? Like, who made that call? Was it Naomi pushing him? Was it that Naomi submits to him and that was his decision? Did they both just agree that it's a good idea? Whatever it was, it was a bad decision to move out of the promised land into the land of Moab, a place of unbelievers, because of a famine. As a result of that, you understand there's a lot of remorse, and rightly so, because what happens? Her, her husband dies over there, and then her children marry Moabite women. That was forbidden by God, and then they die, her two sons. So she's completely bereft of her of her. Um, her, her family, loss of her husband and her sons. You can imagine the, the, uh, the, the guilt, the remorse that she's dealing with on top of the bereavement that she's dealing with. Um, let's talk about quickly her bitterness. Now, again, why do I say that she's angry with God? Because I do believe she's angry with God. And I believe personally that whenever a person's bitter, ultimately they're bitter with God. Because we all know God could change the situation. So let's talk about, first of all, her inability to help her daughters-in-law. That really bugged her. So let's go down to verse 11. She's talking to her daughters-in-law and just so frustrated that she can't help them. They're, 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 they're widows now. They're young. She says, turn, uh, uh, turn again, my daughters. I'm in verse 11. Why will you go with me? Are there any, yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband, also tonight. And should also bear sons. Would ye tarry for them until they were grown? Would ye stay from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. God has been harsh on me and it's hitting you. And she has a point. She's also very frustrated because of God's strict judgment upon her family's sins. She thinks... It's been over the top. Okay, we were wrong. But really, take my husband, take my children? Look at verse 20 and 21. She's come back to Bethlehem. And remember they, they say, is this Naomi? Remember what Naomi means? Naomi means uh, pleasant or, or, or sunshine. Okay, verse 20. She said unto them, call me not Naomi. Pleasant, sunshine. Call me Mara, which is the word for bitter. So she calls herself bitter. So I'm not judging her. She's, she's telling you what she thinks. Call me bitter, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. God has been very, very bitter to me. Verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Now, um, again, so she feels like God has really come down too hard on me because of my sin. By the way, 
uh, people think that way, if we got what we deserved, where would we be? We'd be in hell. And we'd be now, there now and forever. God does not give us any time this, in this life what we really deserve. Then Naomi's renewed hope. You come to chapter 2. And, um, of course, Ruth comes with her. We, we, you, I think all of you here tonight know the story, that Ruth comes with her mother-in-law as, as the other daughter-in-law leaves to go back to pursue her own happiness. And, and, and Ruth goes out to glean in the fields. That was their way of helping the poor. So when, when the crops would be harvested, uh, the poor people could go out and pick up what, was, what had, had fallen. The, 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 they didn't have the combines and everything that gets almost everything. And so the poor people would go out, and they, 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 it was hard work, but you'd go out there and you could find enough to, to live on. And so Ruth does that. And she's done very well in her first day. And she, she uh, landed in the field of a relative who would be a possible husband for Ruth named Boaz. So you skip down to verse, what is it, 19? Verse 19. So she's got back home. She's made a, had a really good day. She's got quite a bit of grain. Her mother-in-law said unto her, Why, uh, where hast thou gleaned uh, today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and the dead. Okay, now can I stop you for a second? Notice it. Blessed be he of the Lord. So she, she still is talking about God. She's not, uh, and it, it's like Naomi seems to be coming out of her bitterness and her frustration at this point. And she's, she's talking about Boaz there, who hath not left off his kindness. And she's talking about the Lord has not left off his kindness to the living and the dead. Naomi said, the man is near of kin unto us. He's one of our next kins. You see the word kindness there? That's the word for loyal love. Man is showing the loyal love of the Lord here. Ruth the Moabite has said, He also said to me, Also thou shalt stick fast by my maiden, so they have ended all my harvest. And so um, Naomi advises her on that. Naomi now s stopped focusing on her own pain. And I think this is a, a huge key to getting out of the trench of bitterness. And that is, Naomi has stopped focusing on her own pain and starts noticing the goodness of God and the needs of people around her. And she's beginning, the, the light's coming on that, hey, God hasn't forsaken us here. Now, um, so you need to recognize God's loyal love for you. When, when you're stuck in, the, in, the, in that, that bondage of bitterness, you need to see it. Now, was God being loyally loving to Naomi before this? Yeah, he was. But she didn't see it. You remember how she said back in chapter 1 and verse 20, I went out full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Ruth was with her. She wasn't empty. God had blessed her with a daughter-in-law that really loyally loved, Ruth, uh, loved Naomi. She wasn't empty, but she didn't see it. But now she's beginning to see it. Now she's beginning to see that, hey, God is working here. And as she begins to think about Ruth and not herself, and she begins to, sorry about that, and she begins to think about, about God's goodness, the clouds start to clear a little bit. Now, again, she's still going to, there's still struggles, there's still the daily grind, but she's coming out of this. She's getting out of the bitterness. And then focus on blessing other people. That's chapter 3, when she tells Ruth how she can uh, marry Boaz. And you know the, the account, I know many of you do, how that, that weird tradition, isn't it weird? You, you go there and, you, you know, <laughs> anyway, we won't go into all that weird tradition, but the idea is she helped. She's, now, she's not thinking about Naomi and her suffering and her loss. She's thinking about God's goodness and, and, and how God can help Ruth. Now, I want you just to see it. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, well, anyway, uh, we'll, I've got to move on. We're, we're getting low on time. Let's go to Gomer. Uh, this is a tough one. Gomer is a woman she, who's had absolutely humiliated herself with her lifestyle. So you've got to go to the book of Hosea. Um, and again, I'm not going to be able to spend much time on these. I apologize. Um, it's really, the first three chapters of the book of Hosea tell her story. 
And let's just go through it quickly. First of all, Gomer made, and that's, that's the wife's name. Don't think of a guy, Gomer Pyle, as we often think. Think of Gomer as, as the wife. And um, she made some terrible choices. She married a, a, a prophet of God. She married a godly man, but she decided to leave her husband and become a prostitute. If you chapter 2 and verse 2 um, is a really sad verse. Hosea is talking to their children. And he is saying, notice what he says, plead with your mother. Plead. For she is not my wife. Neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms, her prostitution out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts. Hosea is actually saying to the kids, you know, and, and some would even say that, uh, that he's using the word like for judging them. But the idea is she's made this choice to leave her kids, to leave her husband, and to live the life of a prostitute. Then she's also been obstinate in this. It's not even like the kids could talk her out of it. If you go to verse 3, there's a warning. If you don't listen, God's going to judge you strictly. You get down to verse 6. Um, here's how the, this is, by the way, there's a mirror here in the book of Hosea. God is showing a literal example, Hosea and his uh, prostitute wife, and the nation of Israel and God's love for the nation of Israel. That's what he's doing. And so the Lord is saying, this is how I love my people, even though they've been so wicked. And so in, in verse 6, it's, it's a really a great verse. Therefore, Hosea is talking, and God is really talking through him. Behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. He's saying, I'm going to let her consequences get so bad that she's not even going to be able to do her profession anymore. Verse 7, she shall follow after her lovers, but, they shall, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them and shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. She's going to come to the place where she realizes, you know what? I actually had it better back with Hosea before I took this, these dumb choices. Notice verse 8, this is interesting. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Evidently, what was happening is Gomer was, was when she goes, goes off into her life of prostitution, she'd find things at her door that would help her live and, and actually be able to live pretty well. She thought they were coming from her lovers. They were coming from her husband. Hosea was trying to take care of her. But notice, and God is saying, that's what I've done for you, Israel. I've taken care of you, and you've used the blessings I've given you to, 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 for further idolatry. Verse 9, therefore, I will return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax given to her to cover her nakedness. Hosea, and I think God is, is showing this, he's saying, I'm going to take all these blessings that you thought were, were from your lovers, I'm taking them all away. And so though she was obstinate in her evil, uh, she was given a second chance by the worst of circumstances. Uh, Gomer comes to the place where she is absolutely impoverished. All of her lovers have forsaken her. And she's being sold on the slave block. And God comes to his prophet in chapter 3 and verse 1. And he says this, Then said the Lord unto me, Go, yet love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. God's saying, okay, just like I love my people and want to bring them back, Hosea, go down to the slave market and buy her back. And verse 2, so I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver, for a homer of barley, and for half a homer of barley. He gives you how much he paid for. Verse 3, And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Thou shalt not be for another man, so I will also be for thee. He's, you know, he's, got her, he, he's not just her husband, now he's her master. He bought her. So what's going on here? She's got a second chance. She was bought by her own husband on the slave block. She was again told the, uh, to turn from her sin. And a matter of fact, if you read verse 4 and 5, we don't have time to do it, 
She was to prove herself before complete restoration. They were going to live under the same roof, but they were not going to live as man and wife. And God is saying, that's what I'm going to do to my people Israel, actually. We're going to have to rebuild trust here. And so we're going to, we're going to, Israel is going to have no king and no priesthood. And by the way, they're in that spot to this day right now. That's where they're at. No priesthood, no king. Waiting for the king of kings. But they, they're, they're, they're in that estrangement side. And Hosea is a great example, by the way, of restoring a marriage. Hosea is saying, look, we're going to build trust again. You're going to, you're going to be loyal to me. I'm going to be loyal to you. And down the road, then we're going to get back to a relationship of husband and wife. So this woman has choices. What would you tell Gomer? Because we're not told what she does with this. She's given a second chance. What would you tell her? Stay faithful. She is back with her first husband by, by, by being bought. <laughs> okay, let me give them real quickly because we're low on time. Number one, make a complete break from your sin. Proverbs 28, verse 14 says, he that, um, Whoever confesses and forsakes will have mercy. Confesses and forsakes. Develop a new relationship with your husband. We have that New Testament truth. She's going to need to learn to appreciate her husband. She's going to need to learn. Because the number one um, thing that God commands a woman in Ephesians 5, not just submit, but he commands her to reverence or appreciate her husband, to have a great respect for her husband. It goes even beyond respect. You have to develop that. You have to work at that. And then start building a bridge to your kids. I mean, think about it. Those kids have watched their mom walk away into immorality. You think they're just going to, you know, turn around and all, you know... Titus chapter 3 verses, uh, and, and it talks about the older women. I, actually, it's kind of interesting. You probably would need a mentor. The older women would teach the younger men, women to love their ch husbands, to love their children. Homer's going to need that. Okay, I got, one, uh, I got two more. I, I don't think I, I'm, I'm beyond the time. The Syrophoenician woman, how about her? Let me just tell you a couple things about her real quick. Do you remember who she is? Jesus and his disciples are up in the land of, of Syria. They've gotten out of Israel. They need a break from all the people. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 7, verse 24, they didn't want anybody to know they were there. And there's a woman that has tracked them down. <laughs> the Syrophoenician woman. Okay, she's living up there, but she's actually a Canaanite. And she sees and she recognizes Jesus and she starts yelling, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's possessed with a demon. And Jesus' disciples are like, we got to shut this woman up. I mean, we can't, we, we, she's going to blow our cover and, and everybody's going to be around here. We need some time. And Jesus himself ignores her. Finally, she won't, she won't take no for an answer. The fact that the disciples ignore her or are, are trying to get rid of her, the fact that Jesus himself ignores her, she comes up to the Lord. She will not take no for an answer. She says, Lord, help me. And Jesus says to her, it is not fit to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That was a Jewish expression of disdain for the Gentile. He is insulting her. Now, why would he do that? He's testing her faith, isn't he? Yeah. He loves her, but she didn't see it at that moment couple things here quickly. First of all, she had a hopeless case. Outsider, coming at a bad time, irritating the very disciples that, that she's supposed to. She, but she doesn't um, take no for an answer. And Jesus' ultimate response was, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was delivered. Syrophoenician mother, a mother with a... Uh, and I would say uh, it would be a child who's in a, a hopelessly bound by Satan. The last one, did you think about Jesus' mother Mary? And the potential to be bitter against God and his people that Mary would have had? Let's give you a couple thoughts on that quickly. First one is that, how about, could she not be bitter at God? What did the Lord tell her about her son? Her son. 
Yeah, that's later. Yeah, Simeon says that her heart is going to be pierced, but that's later. What did she hear like before he was ever born and shortly after he was born? What were the things that she heard about her son? He shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord shall give him the throne of his father, David. His kingdom shall be forever. Okay? When, when, now you think about that. He is the Messiah. He's the son of God. That's what she's told. Okay? She's told by the shepherds that the Christ, the angels told them the Christ was born. She's told by the wise men they're coming to see the king of the Jews. And so it looks like this picture of all success and, and, and victory. And what does she experience in her life? What's that? She saw, his, she saw her slander, because she slandered as, as, as an illegitimate child. You know, he's like supposed to be an illegitimate child, and she's supposed to be an immoral woman by a lot of these people, because they don't understand the virgin birth. Her own husband almost didn't marry her over it. Then you have, even when, in, in Jesus' adult years, they still attacked him on that, by the way. Who is your father? Okay, then think about the fact that she is at the cross and she watches her son die. Can you imagine what, where is God's will in this? And how about being disappointed with God's people? Looking around and saying, where were you, Peter, when he was arrested? Why didn't you guys do something? I mean, it's one thing, we ladies, but why didn't you guys do something? You ran? But you know where we find her instead? Well, we, first of all, we see the light coming on where, where Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And then I just want you to think about her ultimate response. You know the last time you find Mary in Scripture? The last time. It's in, Matthew, it's in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. And we're out of time. I've got to read this and we'll have to close. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Very simple verse. Probably don't even think about when you're reading through it. These all continued with one accord. This is right after Jesus has ascended to heaven. They're praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Mary is not bitter. She's not rejecting God's people. She is praying with them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. She's going forward. She's going forward by faith. And when God's will, what you think is, is going to happen with your life and with maybe the lives of your family members, when, when that will is not what you expected, we have to be very careful to realize when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's plan is more wonderful than our plan. And it's eternally significant. And we've got to keep that in mind as parents. Are any closing questions or comments? Yeah, John. Uh, and I looked up in Exodus 6, it says Amrad, who was uh, Moses' father, would be 137. Wow. So it's possible John could have had a similar lifespan as she was alive during Exodus. It's, it's, it is possible. Now, um, yeah, because Amrad married Jochebed, right? Yeah, so it is possible. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, so, okay, you're saying what again now? So, so Judah and Tamar have Perez. Right. And, and six generations down is Boaz. Yeah. Um, and then David and Christ eventually. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so what you're saying is there's, there's a number of years in between those, yeah. I will say this, that genealogies, um, there many times are gaps in them that, that, uh, they don't always give every generation. For instance, like if you look in Matthew, they have Boaz's dad, uh, Boaz being the son of, Rah of Rahab, the harlot, and probably there are generations between them. Because you get 350 years of the judges period. So. The point was just there's a link between the two, two characters. There, oh, exactly. Good point. That there is a, there is a link between Tamar and and. Um, and and Ferez and, uh, and Boaz, absolutely. Good, 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 good. All right, anything else?
Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, thank you for these examples of far less than perfect situations. Lord, we just we judge things by our own uh, temporary viewpoint, and it just is not uh, just not accurate. We 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 don't see what you see. Your ways are higher than our ways, and your thoughts than our thoughts. Help us to keep that in mind. And I pray that this this study would have been an encouragement, particularly to our moms t t today who. Um, I, I know that we can so uh, uh, wrap our lives around uh, what we see with our kids. And so I just pray that this would be an encouragement. And Lord, all of us, all of us go through these type of situations where, where we failed thee or where we, we feel like we're in the middle of, a, of just a terrible situation. And, and many times it's our own fault. We're very grateful for the way that you stepped into these different situations and didn't set them all perfect at that moment but certainly made an eternal difference in every one of these cases. Thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the joy of being together tonight. May we think on these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for coming. We'll have our prayer meeting over in the uh, annex for those that can stay for about the school.